will be telling us about this platform for next gen interactive content that is hyper personalized, exponentially engaging, and can be shared and played instantly inside of popular apps with no app download or integration needed. We'll also be hearing from Shin Kun Wu, co-founder of RCT Studio. RCT is a next-gen creative studio and interactive entertainment company harnessing the latest in AI to offer truly immersive VR experiences. And then finally, we're going to have Wilson Huang, the co-founder and CEO of Squab Gaming. The Uber for gaming, Squab is a marketplace for video game players to hire on-demand gaming partners in three clicks. Gamers can easily find their perfect teammates and expert, expert players can make money from the games they're good at. A few housekeeping items before we jump in. So like all of our events in the past, if you've attended, uh, attendees will be muted for the duration of the strategy session. The speakers are gonna be displayed on video throughout the discussion. Audience engagement and questions are encouraged. At the bottom of the screen, you're gonna see an icon for Q&A, raise hand and chat on your Zoom window. So please feel free to get in on the fun, submit your questions that you have in the Q&A section. We'll get to those if we have time. Uh, if you want to see this again or tell your friends about how awesome it is, a recording of the strategy session is going to be posted on the .LA website by the end of the day. And if you love .LA, make sure you sign up and subscribe to our daily newsletter to catch every headline. The run a show before we jump in here. Each company is going to present for 10 minutes, then we're going to have 10 minutes of of questions from and discussion with our judges. And lastly, this is a showcase. There's no winner or loser, but instead we're focused on highlighting some truly innovative companies for you and giving you a window into what the process of pitching to elite investors is like. So without further ado, let's get started. Artie is gonna be up first. Ryan, take it away. All right, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share screens, give me one moment. Okay. All right, so we are Artie. We're an LA uh, startup. We're a seed stage company. We've been around since the fall of 18. Uh, we've been pretty heads down uh, for the last year and a half, almost uh, building technology and getting ready for kind of our launch. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So a couple of questions to pose. Well, first off, what if interactive content could be shared and played as easily as a YouTube video? You know, we'll get more into this, but obviously we've had web-based games for a long time, JavaScript, HTML5, progressive web apps. How could we perhaps do things differently? And what if we could actually optimize for social media and have interactive experiences inside social, just like we've had YouTube videos? And then secondly, what if you could interact with your favorite characters and celebrities, you know, the larger personalities you follow on social in a whole new way? What if you could engage with them in a, in, a, in a new way that's more immersive and more engaging. Um, it's not just photos or videos. So before we get into all that, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about the team and kind of who we are and what we're doing. Um, so our team has decades of experience combined across uh, interactive and uh, technology. Um, we are folks from you know, various different gaming companies, various different technology companies. To speak about the founders for a moment, um, I came up through the business side of entertainment initially. So I started at CA here in Los Angeles. I then worked for Paramount Pictures for the president of the studio. Uh, I became a studio executive. I then went to become a studio executive at Fox and Fox's new regency, where for the first 12 years of my career, I, oversee, I oversaw feature films from sort of the conception of an idea all the way to the release. Um, so worked on a number of films there. Uh, most notably, 12 Years a Slave was uh, the last film I worked on. We won Best Picture. Um, but I was, you know, getting quite uh, bored and uh, looking to move into technology. I'd always sort of grown up as an amateur technologist. Um, so when virtual reality came around again in 2015, I jumped in. I joined one of the larger emerging startups called Felix and Paul Studios. And I took over the business operations from uh, putting together a content slate, partnerships, strategy, um, biz dev, you name it. We were able to do partnerships with NASA and SpaceX, send VR technology to the space station. We did two projects with Obama. Uh, I was able to acquire the IP uh, Jurassic World from Universal, and we did overall deals with Oculus, Google, and Fox, and Fox Next. Um, my co-founder, he also came from the traditional entertainment space, but on the technology side. He was involved in uh, the first digital film, which was surprisingly Book of Eli not too long ago. He also um, was involved in um, face replacement, crowd simulation, and some of the algorithms today that are on your phone for 
face filters. Uh, he was involved in the early development of a lot of computer vision technology. He then went on to work for Chad Hurley, co-founder of YouTube. Uh, Chad had a startup studio that he launched after he left YouTube where they launched 12 different consumer facing content apps, exited a couple of them. Armando then went to go work with within um, VR company in LA and then at Facebook in VR. So he and I met and we decided to both leave VR and AR start already um, because we wanted to bring immersive and interactive content to a wider audience on social. Um, so our team has um, dozens of games under our belt uh, from the gaming industry over the years, lots of casual games, mid-core games, um, and sort of games analogous to some of the things we're working on today. Uh, we're backed by a number of uh, investors in LA that are strategic in the uh, media space as well as in Silicon Valley and a lot of helpful angels that uh, you know, help us along the way. Um, we've got some really key advisors from the gaming space like Kent um, or Chad from YouTube and some folks on the AI side that really help us out. So to get back into it, what we've done is we've created a platform for next-gen interactive content that has unique optional features. So typically today we'll play mobile games with our thumbs and the phone screen, um, but now we can uh, play with our voice and uh, computer vision so we can interact with game characters in a whole new way offering um, more personalized and immersive uh, gameplay. So on the speech side, we built technology from the ground up for gaming. Initially, we were bootstrapping off of Google's speech to text. We were funded with some non-dilutive capital from Google early on in our bootstrapping phase to do some experiments. And one thing we realized is speech technology today, um, broadly speaking, is not meant for gaming. It's um, not meant for gaming in terms of its cost structure. Um, we found it would be prohibitively expensive to use at scale for mobile games, um, but also it's not very accurate for key demographics um, and especially underserved de demographics, like let's say teenage girls from the deep south that have a deep southern accent, um, you know, typical speech recognition won't be quite as accurate with them. So what we were looking to do is to be able to custom tune speech models to a particular game, game character, um, and lexicon of that IP, but also uh, tune speech models to the particular demographics we expected to serve. We also worked on cost. So we partnered with Mozilla. We built a scalable backend for Mozilla Deep Speech, um, which ultimately allows us to achieve 30x cost savings compared to Amazon, Google, and Microsoft speech services. So that's been really helpful for us in our financial model. Um, but if you're playing a game that does use voice control, that's completely optional. You can instantly switch to traditional gameplay with a touch, or you can actually text with your favorite characters now. So if you're familiar with some of the casual games in the narrative genre, choose your adventure games like Episode or Choices, or you remember the Walking Dead Telltale games, um, some of the games that we're making with our partners are in this kind of narrative game genre to start, but we expect um, to branch out into other genres with other partners. Computer vision, on the other hand, can be used to recognize if the player is engaged, the camera's on their phone, it can be used to recognize objects. If you were in AR mode, let's say playing a game like Pokemon Go, you could use objects in your environment as uh, input into the game. Um, and again, this, these features won't be for everyone or for every game or genre, but they're optional, but we're really bullish on the future of AI and real-time game engines. Um, but we didn't stop there. Really, the larger uh, mission here is to make interactive content more accessible to a wider audience. And we felt like we could do that by um, bringing it inside of social media in a seamless way. Um, so all of our games can be shared as links inside of social platforms, just like you share a YouTube video. So in a post, in an Instagram bio, um, you know, on Twitter, Twitch, TikTok very soon, which, which is going to allow you to share links, Facebook, YouTube app, et cetera, and inside of Snap. Um, we're doing things in a different way. Um, we'll explain that from a technology standpoint shortly. And this unlocks a massive opportunity in our minds. There's 500 billion hours uh, consumers spend on these apps every year, very little of which is spent playing games, except for if you look into Facebook's native games or Snap's games, a lot of these games are great, but they're um, platform exclusive. They can't travel across platforms. Um, so this is all made possible to some technology we've made that's analogous to cloud gaming, but what we tried to do is put the things that require super low latency on the client side, predominantly rendering. So if you're all familiar with cloud gaming, typically today uh, or today's incarnation, you would do pretty much everything on the cloud and push video to the player and then the player pushes buttons, goes back up. And some stats we saw were only 25% of homes in North America today have fast enough internet um, at home for cloud gaming to operate smoothly. So forget about mobile and you know, 4G, LTE, 5GE, 
that wasn't made for cloud gaming in its truest sense of today. And if you look at Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and PlayStation, they're exclusively focused on PC and console and AAA games. So what we wanted to do is figure out how can we get all the benefits of cloud gaming and instant play that's platform agnostic, but solve the latency issues. So we're doing this um, through WebAssembly and lower level C and not with JavaScript or HTML5 or progressive web apps. So that's sort of our new approach. We also found out there was a way to create a unified API for all this technology and then uh, let that wrap into uh, something that can commingle with Unity. So you can create games in Unity just like you already do today and then you can access our API um, for instant play and then optional features like voice and vision. Um, so that's a little bit more about the technology. So our view is that interactive content is the future of social media. We believe that video is not the end all say all on social and, and we're really excited to bring interactive content in a really seamless organic way to social. So here just to illuminate, you could imagine Marvel or any other media company creating a game. They could share the game in a link. Um, consumers could click the link, you know, they could promote it and post about it. And instantly you would play the game and it starts up in less than a second and we're dynamically loading assets to you. Um, all the gameplay decision-making and AI stuff's happening on the cloud. And if you're using voice, you can start talking to your characters um, and be a part of the game that way. Or you can play traditional mobile games with traditional gameplay. The other cool feature that we've built is you can instantly text with Deadpool or say any other character. But also while you're playing, you can share video clips or live stream instantly. So let's say I'm playing a game inside of Instagram's um, walls inside their embedded web browser. While I'm playing the game in key moments, I can start sharing little video clips back to my friends or I can live stream to my, to my friends on Twitch, which drives organic user acquisition, which we think is really interesting. Um, in terms of hyper-personalization, if you start to access voice and vision, um, what first and foremost, we're GDPR and CCPA compliant. We're very concerned with uh, user privacy. We're leaving all personally identifiable information about the player on device on the client side, but we can um, source really high end um, or I guess high level insights about, well, what did everyone collectively said uh, in the gaming experience? How many people felt like Deadpool was a little creepy? Can we run a sentiment analysis algorithm on that? How many people felt Wolverine and Deadpool should do a movie together? Okay, we found out 33% should. How many people said Coca-Cola versus Pepsi? Would a brand like to know that, right? Um, so not only that, but we can uh, offer adaptive gameplay in real time. So as the, the game is learning about you and your preferences through sort of your human input, it can adapt and remember you um, to forge a, a pseudo relationship with you, um, relationship with you over time. Um, and then, of course, this becomes valuable uh, data for our algorithms that helps us improve uh, speech accuracy and computer vision accuracy. So let's talk about some of our first games. This is normally the slide where in my pitch I would show you all the IP we've been acquiring and all the partners we're working with uh, for various reasons because we're kind of in build mode and NDA mode. I won't um, cite them specifically. But I'll just say that um, our first game is with a big uh, family movie property and a big character. Um, it's a casual game. It's a um, narrative game where you go exploring and you kind of go on a elaborate treasure hunt with this character. There's another game that's more of an action adventure RPG. Um, that's with another big movie character. We're also working with one of the biggest music artists um, with over 100 million followers on social and with one of the biggest athletes in the world. So we're trying to operate um, in, in the sort of casual gaming zone with a focus for ourselves more in the narrative genre. We expect other game developers and publishers who we give access to our API and tools to you know, start to make things in other more traditional uh, genres. We're really excited about trying to find the sweet spot between sort of storytelling and the kind of storytelling you see on social with streaming and, and, and vlogging and such and, and gaming and really trying to figure out what is the sweet spot between core gamers and would-be gamers who are not yet playing games. Um, so this is sort of more about how we imagine a game going viral. Um, so if you could imagine our IP partners would share a game um, to all their fans, the content is instantly playable wherever they find it, and then they can share video back and this drives organic user acquisition. Um, so where we are today to finish up, we've built the technology over the last three years. We've partnered with top IP holders and celebrities. We're launching our first games ourselves. Um, and similar to maybe a company like Niantic, we decided IP would give us great reach, especially inside social media, when that's your greatest advantage is to serve pre-existing large audiences. And then we'll start to open up our tools and APIs to other studios and other publishers and see what they want to create. And that's already. 
All right, great. Let's uh, hand it over to our judges for some discussion. Uh, great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I guess my first question is, you know, long-term vision for the company. Are you looking to be a tools platform type company um, and scale into that? Um, or is uh, making games also core to what you do in the long term? Yeah, I mean, in the short term, we felt like dog fooding with our own tech and platform would be important, similar to Niantic in a sense, like if they're coming to market with brand new features like GPS or geolocated games and AR for the first time, and they could release a couple games, big IP, they could get a lot of reach. So that's kind of been our plan is to release the first few uh, games um, ourselves while we've been starting to talk to other publishers who already operate in the IP driven gaming space on mobile. Um, so we've already kind of been hard at work in starting to extend those relationships for the kind of half dozen or dozen studios and publishers that have already been successful there. Um, but our larger goal is to be something larger than a studio or a publisher. It's really to let other studios and publishers onto our platform. Um, but what we felt like we had to do is we had to create the API and tools to allow them to access these new features and, and publish in this new way. But it was very important for us not to disrupt the way that they make games. We didn't try to create a process where you have to make games with a brand new game engine. We wanted to empower people to use the tools they already know, like Unity. So today we support Unity and then shortly uh, we'll also support Unreal. Great. Um, yeah, thank you for, for that. Um, in particular, a truncated window, it's never easy to, to do things in, in 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, I, I, we typically look at things a little bit later stage, so seed isn't in our wheel. So we've done a lot of seed investing over the years. I think uh, with respect to um, investing in a games business, um, albeit if your long-term aspirations um, are more of a, a platform um, middleware play, um, in the short term, I think I would be uh, interested in better understanding what the actual games are, right? So sure. I think that the forensically looking in the rearview mirror of the roadkill of celebrities and, you know, talent and even incredible intellectual property coupling themselves, you know, to a business that's willing to either write a big minimum guarantee check or give up warrants in the business or whatever that may be. There's a lot of that roadkill. So I think kind of qualitatively, um, you know, for example, you, you referenced Niantic, which I think is, you know, one of the best examples ever uh, sure. of a partnership with an IP. But the reason that IP worked was, in my opinion, there are two reasons it worked. One, it was a collectible IP. It's been collectible for multi-generations. Two, Niantic didn't push the envelope on the technology. They, they, they executed against it exactly to the limits with which you'd have a soft landing if you were new to it. But if you were a more sophisticated gamer and you understood um, what they were trying to do, you could dig a little deeper and have a little more fun. But at the end of the day, it was still, and it still is single digits in terms of folks that engage the AR, right? So, totally. Totally. so that's kind of the gimmick of, of that game. I think for me, um, I would- That's analogous to, to voice for us where we're gonna make that optional just like they make AR optional. And that was my, my other question would be, you know, so what percentage of, the audience do you do you see engaging in some of these these permutations uh, to you know traditional game consumption? It just all comes back to me. The game's got to rock, right? So if you're going to use this as the first example, the first platform to attract others to what it is that you're doing, in particular, yep. you know, as a publisher and you want to be able to license out your API and your tech, then the first few shots on goal, you know, have to be incredible. They've got to achieve that escape velocity, and for them to achieve achieve that escape velocity, I don't really care about you know, the IP or the talent behind it, like the game just gotta be wicked awesome. Agree, I definitely agree with that. So yeah, I mean, our focus has really been to make those games awesome. We're, we're already working on them, um, you know, and similar to Niantic, yeah, like AR for Niantic is a long-term goal. They kind of believe in the future of where I, AR could go. You know, we'll see if we get Apple glasses one day and other things. I think for us, that's kind of our feeling on these next gen features like voice and vision. We don't expect those to be, you know, see mass adoption overnight, but we do believe in the long tail of our business. If we're successful over say a 10 year plus period, if we're that lucky, we believe that AI and sort of hyper-personalization within the interactive space is gonna be the next frontier to deeper engagement. Today, really the thing that first and foremost is of interest to us that we think is immediately viable today, um, which I think is analogous to the geolocated factor of Pokemon Go, 
um, where sort of AR, I guess, is more secondary. For us, it's the distribution into social. And I think when we looked at, you know, Pocket Gems and kind of what they've been doing with Episode or way back when Walking Dead with uh, Telltale, which was wildly successful, despite the fact the company, you know, uh, closed for, for lots of reasons we've all read about. Um, and we looked at kind of that, that space and kind of how Pocket Gems have been uh, leveraging IP. We felt like that genre for us was really cheap to make. We could have a lot of shots on goal while we're still seed stage. And we could make something that we believe would appeal to um, not only gamers, but would be gamers or non-gamers. Um, and, and particularly on social, I think, you know, when you think about what games might work there, you can certainly look back to Zynga and you can look back to some of the things from, you know, a decade ago. But then I think you also have to look forward and you have to say like, how has the world changed? How have things changed since we've been interacting with, um, you know, things on Snap, right? Or like, how, how do people want to interact with their favorite characters today? You know, and I think we've been reading the tea leaves, virtual characters on social have become more and more popular, whether it's Hatsune Miku in Japan or little Michaela here. But I think we're at the tip of the iceberg because we have to figure out like, what's the actual genre um, inside social? Um, so for us, we're going to kind of go down a couple of paths that we feel are exciting to us that we can execute, but we hope to inspire others to explore um, different genres that have already been proven. And I'm also curious, what is your, I guess, in your first rollouts, what's your demographic audience that you're appealing to? Is it teens and early 20s in terms of the social engagement you're looking for? Yeah, it's, it's really short sessions, kind of daily sessions. So for example, one of the titles we're working with, um, with a superhero, it's um, dozens of interactive episodes that get released over the course of a year. And every week there's a new story arc and every week you can go back and replay these, these sort of interactive narratives. Think of it like a telltale game, but rather than having four explicit choices on your screen or like Netflix Bandersnatch, you can now open that up into a multitude of choices because you can either text with that favorite character or you can talk to them. So rather than sort of being um, directed at the, the path, so you can create your own path. Um, so we're doing that also by getting away from traditional branching and bottlenecking kind of tree-based structures into more of a graph-based approach where it almost feels like an open world of a narrative experience. But it, so just to follow on Gregory's question, because, you know, episodes and with Pocket Gems, and, and there's, there's only been a couple of others that have actually made that model make sense, in particular on mobile. So demographically, you know, it's skewed female, um, sure. which which is kind of the holy grail, right? So in, yep. in mobile, you know, they spend more, they spend more time. Um, yep. There's still a deficit, you know, 55, 45%, you know, yep. male to female in terms of, of games consumption, but on mobile, they punch above their weight and they're, they're great users. Um, yep. So I think back okay. to the demo, because then you, you also talk about multiple social distribution channels. And yep. so just if I understood, so I could, capture uh, moments and then dynamically publish through um, whichever default channels I chose as a, as, a, as a user, as a user of the experience? That's right, yeah. So j just to answer your first question and Gregory's question, yeah, we are focused on sort of 13 to 18 as the core and then kind of um, extending into millennials. And we are very much focused on the female audience. Um, but I would say more than anything to sort of not to delineate between male and female, we're focused on like uber fandom, right? We're, we're, we're really focused on who do we think is a highly engaged audience on social with a particular IP or celebrity or character where we can actually, you know, circumvent app stores and the 30% fees and ultimately not have to lean into paid media and massive CAC because we can have that partner do the work for us. So really we're looking at uh, trying to upend the economics to the favor of the game creators and the IP holders by reducing sort of paid media as that big component inside of CAC um, if you put the power of distribution back into the IP holders hands if they have that massive audience. Great, um, we're running up on time here. So Gregory, Peter, any last thoughts for Ryan? I, I just, again, for me, um, Ryan, you know, um, it'll come down to the game. So be really interested once you know, we'd be able to take a look at, at the gameplay, the game mechanic, what it is that you're trying to do, the the onboarding strategy, you know, go-to-market strategy, everything else, you know, very compelling um, on paper, um, you know, would but for, for us to get, you know, to, to get interested, um, 
just demonstrating my master's degree in the obvious, it would come down to, you know, the, the, the game. So very interested to see what you guys are up to. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think I'd be very interested to see the game and how whatever voice or whatever you're enabling that's a differentiator plays out and makes that unique. Cool. Well, thank you both. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks so much, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Honestly, what an interesting concept that really makes you think what comes next after social media and how we engage with our favorite celebrities and influencers. I'm, I'm curious to see. Uh, so just one note for the presenters, when you are, are done presenting, before we go into the discussion portion, just stop sharing your screen so that we can see everyone's faces in, in their full glory. Uh, so next up, we're going to hear from RCT Studio. So take it away, Shin Quinn. I think you're on mute. Okay. Sarah, you some time to sharing my screen a little bit huh? See if some problem with my computer. Uh, I will join again. I, I need to withdraw right now. Sorry, I will rejoin again. Okay. Okay. Uh, do we do we want to then move on to uh, to Squab Wilson? Are you are you ready so that we don't lose time here? Uh yeah, I, I can go. I can go now. Okay, great. Thanks so much for being flexible <laughs> for, for dealing with tech. So take it away, Wilson from Squab. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Wilson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Squad Gaming. Squad Gaming is a marketplace for video game players. Oh, sorry. I, uh, sorry like, oh, okay, okay, okay. It's I'm sorry. Cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. The Squad Gaming is a exciting marketplace for video game players to hire on-demand gaming partner. It is like an Uber specifically for gamers. As we all know, gaming is huge now. The total gaming market is $140 billion and it keeps growing fast. We actually have done some surveys online. It suggests 35% of young adults in the US can be defined as core gamers who play over 10 hours every week. Among the core gamers, 85% of them are interested in on-demand gaming partner service, which is exactly what we offer in Squad Gaming. And the current team-based gaming experience is far. There are a couple of problems, which is pretty common among game players. We look at two different types of game players. Uh, one is average core gamers. Uh, they, they have trouble finding teammates for multiplayer games. Uh, they always have bad teammates just ruin the whole gaming experience. They're the potential buyer of our marketplace. And and there's the other type of player who are the elite players. They need a better and more sustainable way to monetize their gaming skills. They're the potential seller of the marketplace. Uh, we, we call them the gamer pal. The solution for this problem is a mobile app for players to easily and securely hire expert players to team up in the game. This is how Squad Gaming app looks like. Um, it allows users to instantly start a game with on-demand teammates in three clicks. Uh, they, they just go to the homepage as shown on the left out screen. They can export the current available gamer pal uh, on the on squad gaming. Once they pick one, they can send out a hiring request. Then they go to the order detail page on the right of the screen. They just fill it out and ready for the game. And right now we have a pretty simple business model. We take 10% of each transaction made on Squad Gaming. We think it's the right price to attract users. We will introduce premium subscriptions and a digital tipping system in the future to expand the income sources. This is a, and what's great about it is actually a proven business model that works in China. There's one Chinese company, Bixin, 
offers pretty similar uh, service in China. They already have $400 million annual revenue plus years. However, they cannot go to US market because gamers are on a different server. They have different gaming culture and they even play different games. <clears throat> Currently, our gamers are going, to, uh, are going to Reddit and Discord to find uh, teammates to team up, but they're not built specifically for this. And gamers are never going to need to get any response anytime soon. And this gamer sensei offering a gaming coach service, which requires gamer to make appointment in advance, but it is against the gaming nature because nobody plans for a game week or days ahead. So Squad Gaming is indeed the first marketplace in the US market to let gamers easily hire on-demand gaming partners. And this is the Squad Gaming's roadmap. Our first step is getting to the market with the niche market, which is Chinese students in the US. Because our funding teams, uh, are, we were Chinese students, we know the community. And as I mentioned before, the service is available in China. So Chinese students are more familiar with this, with this service. We are, uh, it's easy for us to start with. Once we drive the network effect, uh, we can move to the step two and scale it to the general college students in North America. Uh, then we, we can further strengthen our community and make it go viral. Uh, eventually, we can go to step three and spread it out to the whole gamer community in North America. And this is where we are today. Even our product has not launched yet. Uh, has not launched yet. Uh, our MVP is getting traction and proving the demand. We successfully we have successfully penetrated the the first initial market, and we have over one thousand users and five thousand dollar weekly revenue in April and all, all the growth is organic so far. We have spent zero dollars on, on customer acquisitions. And so far we are on track with our growth plan and milestones. We have launched the uh, MVP in February and our LIS mobile app is coming in early May. The Android version will come a month later and we'll keep improving that from there based on user feedback. We're currently a team of two uh, and working with a third party developer team to help us uh, launch the app. Our goal is to reach $16 million gross revenue in the first year after the app launch. To achieve this goal, we're asking for $500,000 investment to run for 12 months and expertise in growing business to move spot gaming forward. Funding will mostly go to development, engineering, and marketing. We would love to have you help us in this journey. Thank you for your time. I'm open to questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Wilson. And thanks for, for rolling with that change on the fly. Uh, Gregory, Peter, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think my first question is, how do you think about um, supply in terms of having enough people on the platform offering their services um, so that if someone comes on and they want to play, there's always someone available for them to play with. I think that'd be the biggest friction point. If they come on and there's no one available to partner with, then they would have a poor customer experience. Yeah, that is true. That's a very good question because we, we definitely face a like a chicken and egg situation in, the, in, this, in this specific product. Uh, so we, we solve it with like reaching out to people uh, are currently offering coaching and uh, some gaming partner service on Discord, Reddit. And we know, we know, some, uh, we know the community are doing it. They have, a, like, they have a demand for an app like that to make their business going more easier and uh, fluent. And, and, we, we, uh, and this is actually easier to grow once we have like a small user base because um, the, the concept of making money by playing games are, can be so easily spread in the community because the gamers are, will, will, will not say no to doing it once they, they find out how it works and, it's, and they find out how easy it is. 
But have you confined it to certain games in the early stages so that there isn't a broad swath of games that people would come out and look for? Yeah, so we are focusing on three three games for now. It's League of Legends, uh, Fortnite, and CSGO. So these are the the most, uh, I would say, most popular multiplayer games today. And we're specifically targeting these three games as a starting point. And before, before you ask a question, Peter, Wilson, would you mind uh, stopping to share your screen so we can we can oh, show sure, everyone sure. their beautiful faces? Thanks, Wilson. Go ahead, Peter. Um, so I, I had a couple of questions. One is an extension of Gregory's question, which is um, supply. Um, actually, I like your answer. I think you're right. I think there's going to be a lot of people who opportunistically um, would want to provide what they construed to be their services to the demand side of it. I think again, quality control of that supply would be a big question for me, right? So, cause I think Uber has done a better job of late but they went through a period where uh, they were under a tremendous amount of scrutiny for the lack of vetting um, and it exposed them to a tremendous amount of liability, horrible PR, I mean, they were really able to capitalize on, on some of that um, negative narrative. So I think I'd be interested in, in um, what the quality, the qualitative screening is there. And then um, also with respect to, to Gregory's question, because I was thinking about that too, um, would you be able to, is there going to be through WhatsApp, if you will, the ability to alert uh, a potential customer that, hey, at this moment, there are 15 potential partners that meet the criteria with which you would engage the service and you know to play league or there's 17 you know online now that qualify for Fortnite or there's 12 for CSGO. I think that kind of um, two-way real-time communication uh, with your cohort could be really valuable. Um, you know, and interesting. I remember back in the day where there were some communication platforms like Xfire um, and you would get alerts. It was useful because it would you would be out and about, it would pull you in through you know, rudimentary SMS texting, like, hey, there's a squad you know, getting ready to get after it in you know, CSGO. And more often than not, if you were proximate to a PC, you're gonna get online and you know, get after it. So um, the, the, my question, full circle, just going back to kind of quality, what is the mechanism for screening? Yeah, so so we have a we actually have a verification step for people registering their uh, to registering themselves as a gamer pal sort of providing service. They need to provide the the screenshot of their like game level as uh, uh, of the game they selected, and they need to uh, get, provide a screenshot of their uh, past uh, match history uh, to prove their game skills. And right now it's sort of done uh, manually and. And in the in the future, we we hope we can integrate it with the API with the game publisher and make it a auto automatically process where users just link to their uh, gaming account and proving their uh, level. So just to extend on that, Wilson, every time I say your name, I think of the movie Castaway. Sorry, I can't help myself. But um, the relative, like, what game do you play, right? So what's your go-to game? League of Legends, Fortnite, CS:GO. So for you personally. Oh, for B, League of Legends, League of Legends. So you know how nasty, right? You know the the goings ons can be when you get paired with with random folks in yeah. an online competitive game. So I think part of my question was, yeah, I think it's more binary. You can determine how good a person is at a particular game. That's easier to track. They can hack it, but they'll get fleshed out quickly. I think there's also got to be some. I'm curious about what degree of filtering you're going to have for that because the toxicity in gaming is something that people like Gregory and myself have been taking a firm stand against for a very long time. Um, I think that's gonna be as important. I can tell you to parents who may support their kids using your product, that's gonna be a huge gatekeeping factor. Right, right. So yeah, cause, cause uh, except for the gaming level itself, we will have a like a review and rating system. So after every order, we will let the both party uh, review each other. This is a this is a good way for tracking a how how toxic or not the, a player is and uh, how how good the person 
quality of the gamer is. And uh, we, we will have the rating and the review just directly showing on the profile of each each player. So users can easily uh, have a, like a general feel about it. Yeah, if you pull that off, that could be a huge PR marketing boon for you guys, right? If that yeah, means- that's, I mean, we, we definitely, that's, uh, that's the core part of our like uh, entire product because we, we want to make sure the the quality we're offering are at good level. So yeah. that's the problem we're trying to solve. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the other thing I would say, and just at the end of your pitch is, uh, it seems like you're trying to accomplish a lot. You're servicing multiple games. You can be on multiple platforms. Um, I guess I'd be more curious on the breakdown of what you guys spend on. $500,000 does not seem like a lot of money. And it seems to me that if you're going to run for a significant of a time and accomplish these things, you might want to think about raising more money. Um, so you're not constrained in being able to tackle uh, these problems. Yeah, the, I think the most often, right, I think the, the wisdom that we're hearing these days, sounds like Gregory's going to write you a check, by the way, um, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, you know, you'd want 18 months in light of what's happening in the world right now, right, just as a minimum. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's a, it's a longer conversation it's offline, but I, I tend not to, to disagree with, with that notion. Okay, I see. Really helpful. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Wilson, uh, for Thank that. I, I will definitely use it in the future because I'm terrible at gaming, so I need all the help I can get. <laughs> so, uh, Shinkoin, over to you with RCT Studio. Yeah. Can you see my screen right now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm co-founder of our CT studio. My name is um, Wu Xian Kun. Uh, sorry for the kiosk I made before because I will introduce you something called a kiosk box letter. Yeah, um, we're an artificial intelligence company um, focus on using AI to empower the open world game or interactive film. Before this company, we built a smart speak company called Riven Tech. Um, it was acquired by Baidu, the Chinese version of Google. Um, by the way, Baidu has the best AI tech in China. So, yeah, so, sorry, you can now see my face right now. Yeah, can you see my, you know, Based right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. By the way, uh, Baidu has the best AI tech in China. So we have spent five to six years in um, conversational AI and human human machine interactive build. So after leaving Baidu, we decided to apply the tech we accumulate in some sort of vertical area. And we choose entertainment We're, uh, uh, as a targeting industry we want to change. So we are creating two things. Uh, one is a new kind of, uh, you could call it interactive film or regarded as an open world game. It is kind of a mixture of a game and film, and we'll explain in details later. And one is a new tool. We call it a Morpheus engine. Some revolution features are integrated in the engine. It could dramatically increase efficiency of making that kind of film, and even traditional ones. So what is interactive film? You maybe watch the Black Mirror Panas made by film, uh, Netflix, right? And viewers can make decisions and choices um, for the main character by choosing A, B, C, D. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Are we still on that opening? Okay, I didn't. Yeah, I we were on the first slide. Unless I'm. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So viewer can make decisions for the main characters by choosing A, B, C, D, and the sub point, and making your own narratives, but but very limited, right? We won't. Make we want to make something truly interactive. Um, try to think if you could use your natural language to speak directly to other characters in the movie and they will respond to you according what you speak. So that means you can create nearly in the endless possibility of your own narratives. And then more impressively, screenwriters will no need to write all the narratives by their hand. The only thing they need to do is define the characters the world view and the world view of the movie. So yeah, just like the virtual Westworld. In Westworld, 
they just create NPCs and tell them who they are, but never tell them to do acting. So as you can see in the graph, in traditional movie, uh, it will be like a story starts and what happened, what happened. So it comes to, a, to an end. So there is a, a, one outcome and one experience. In traditional interactive film, there are multiple branch uh, linear. Story starts and then what happened. Then at some point that you choose A, B, C, D, then you got a, a story like A, then again and again, you will get uh, 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 several outcomes and a several experience. For the movie that we call Morpheus, a movie, it will be like story starts. You get into a chaos box. The chaos box is an AI algorithm that creates narratives, narratives automatically. In each chaos box, you speak to the NPCs and the chaos box will, will create the story automatically. Several outcomes, infinite experience. Why infinite experience? Because every time, even you use different tone of same word, NPC will react in a different way. And as I mentioned about, we also create a tool to help create on render side. It is a, what first in real time text render tool. Um, everyone can use it in a very simple way. You just need to input natural language. Like there is a man, the man threw the cup to the table in from the sofa. Uh, there's a man walking and it will immediately become a video and also can understand basic real world physics. Uh, why real world physics? What is a real world physics? For example, if you input a man through a cup to a sofa, the video shows basically what you input. But if you input a man through a cup to, to a desk, the cup will break automatically in a video because the deck is hot, the sofa is soft. So uh, you can see the live demo or video on our website, um, rct.studio or Google RCT Studio. Yeah, so we also um, developed a motion generation prediction system. Uh, let us watch a very short video. Sorry. Yeah, um, as you can see, the, the walking person can avoid the subject in the walking path automatically. And in fact, all the motion is now pre-recorded by motion capture. It is generated by algorithm, by computing in real time. So this is uh, the motion generation, dynamic motion prediction generation system. You can see the full video on our website as well. So um, last, I would like to show you a short video of our game demo. Oh, who the hell else works here? Uh, I do, I'm the manager. As you can see, NPC react, can react accordingly to what you say. The graph shows the status of each NPCs. So uh, if you speak to the NPCs, they will react in a way according to what you speak. So it, it is very simple. Why? Uh, it is very simple. The interaction is very natural, isn't it? So um, basically, those are the products. This is a product matrix. So um, a new kind of indirect film, we, or we can call it a game, a kiosk box, a text render, working AI. It's a middleware technology. And, and for the bottom line, there is a separate uh, you know, solutions to the uh, industry and enterprise users. We can generate from the, uh, you know, the, the, the kiosk box and text render working AI. So uh, for the future plan, uh, there are three steps. In phase one, we want to unite the creative uh, content to simply make a good content engine. In phase two, we want to create a virtual realm of interactive film, uh, interactive entertainment. Imagine there is a oasis in the movie Ready Player One. In phase three, we want to digitize the human brain. It sounds a little bit dangerous, but quite interesting, right? How? Because um, the virtual world is, we, we want to make it a mirror of a real world. That's it. So for business model, it, it is very simple as well. Uh, we sell copies to end users, a license engine to the industries. That's it, very simple. And we're building um, um, corporations uh, with our film and gaming industry uh, companies as well. And that is Lionsgate and even the Canadian porn website, your porn. 
We also work with some academic institutions um, like Lambda. Uh, it's one of the best reinforcement learning lab in China. A lot of the top game development students work for us as well. Last, we um, have three investors right now. Uh, YC, Sky Saka Capital, and the Makers Fund. Um, the post money valuation of our last one is uh, 52 million US dollars. We in total have raised uh, 12 million US dollars. Uh, we want to raise uh, 20 million US dollars in the next round. Valuation and fundraising amount all can be new, negotiated. And some very good funds have shown strong intention of uh, investing in this round. And we're based in LA, obviously, yes. And I also have an office in Beijing. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Shanquan, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be awesome. And over to you, Gregory and Peter. Uh, yeah, so um, some lofty, ambitious goals there. I'd be curious, because uh, it wasn't specifically spelled out, um, what are your milestones or proof points in the next like six to 12 months uh, that come into market, you know, to show what you've accomplished and, um, you know, get the, everyone aware of what you're doing? Yeah, in, in, at the end of the, sorry, I, I'll try to shut up the, the screen recording. Start for a second. Sorry, uh, so I, I just, uh, okay, okay, I got it. There you go, awesome. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I use uh, iPad all the time in Zoom meetings. So I'm now familiar with the laptops, sorry. Yeah, so for my for our milestone, we want to release a commercial product of our game at the end of this year. Yeah, so uh, along this side, uh, we want to cooperate with some um, enterprises and big companies to test uh, the, the our technology like Chaos Box and Text Render to do some project like Game AI and provide services to the enterprise and industry users. And, and the game so, would be a, a VR game? Yeah, uh, it probably can be a, be a VR game. So we um, we think VR is the best way or one of the best way to demonstrate our idea, but we don't stick in VR that much. Yeah. We can, you know, um, demonstrate this uh, concept or idea in the console game or computer PC. That's okay for us. Yeah. It depends on the, you know, cost, time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think just because it was again truncated window, it's a little difficult to follow. Um, yeah. You know exactly what the product roadmap is. I think. I always get afraid of boiling the ocean a little bit with some of these types of things. So, um, cause what you're doing is incredibly ambitious both on the film and on the interactive storytelling side, which is great. Uh, that's not a deficit. I just think it probably would be difficult to wrap my brain around um, doing both at the same time as a startup. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in, in particular in, in, on the traditional media side, um, very slow to, um, adapt and adopt these types yeah. of yeah. Um, yeah. Key totally. changes, albeit kind of forced to, right? So, um, you know, necessity, you know, drives this kind of, of evolution. Um, but that being said, I, I think, is there gonna be a primary focus on the film content versus, cause you listed, you know, a, a list there of eight to a dozen, you know, media companies, are those relationships in place or those deals intact? You know, are you focused more on that first and then the game would be second? Uh, I think probably uh, we will focus on a game companies cooperation because uh, open world gaming may be, um, you know, a, a fee for our, our technology more. So um, probably in this year, we're, the top priority for us is, uh, you know, pro providing the services and technology to big companies like NetEase or Blizzard. Yeah, and try to cooperate it in a corporate wisdom in some certain project to test and stressing our technology then probably and this year we will release but maybe next year we'll release our own title but our own title maybe not a 
pr top priority because you 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 level you you probably very familiar with the industry so uh, it will cost a lot of money and time to you know release your own title so maybe in this year 2020 we probably focus more on the cooperation with a game company yeah companies yeah great i think we're turning into a pumpkin here so um <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you for that segue, <laughs> Peter. Um, well, that uh, wraps up our showcase. Thank you so much to our judges, Gregory and Peter, for your time and expertise. I honestly found it fascinating to get a window into how you think about investing in, in the gaming industry. Um, and of course, thank you to our three companies, RD, RCT, and Squab, for sharing the really exciting things you're working on. And last but not least, thank you so much to you, our audience. We are thrilled to continue connecting with you and bringing the best in the LA tech media and startup space to you. Thanks for having and me. That, oh, thank yeah, you. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, on that note, if you want to connect with any of these companies, contact information will be available in the write up on our website later. And if you want more content from us.la, Go check out our website and uh, make sure to sign up for our newsletter. We have a team of talented reporters and every day we're covering the most crucial stories in the space. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Finally, if you enjoyed today's event, which I hope you did, amazing, we've got more for you. Our pitch showcases happen every other week and we run strategy sessions every Tuesday at 11 a.m. focusing on a different topic. We are also launching a really exciting series next Thursday that I am particularly jazzed about so be sure to look out for more information on that. That's it for me and for our event today. Stay safe. And thank you again to our judges and our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Good day.